grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the word of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. You heard the gospel reading and story for this morning, just to touch on it again briefly. Joseph and Mary have come down again to Jerusalem and into the temple grounds. As they reach the temple grounds, they are greeted first by Simeon and then by Anna. And it struck me this is a little bit like St. Stephanus. Some of you would greet anyone coming in. And you'd pick them up. Oh, isn't that a cute little baby? It's about what's going on here. Except that it's not just cute little baby. Simeon says, My eyes have seen your salvation, Lord, which you prepared in the sight of all nations. And Anna speaks similar words. And then, perhaps a little unsettled, Joseph and Mary continue with their routines at the temple and then head back home. This event comes up 40 days after Jesus' birth. Luke's Gospel actually moves fairly quickly through the early life of Jesus. There is a contrast, for example, John's Gospel. There is virtually nothing of Jesus' early life there. Luke does mention at the beginning of his Gospel that he had done research, and so he gives us the benefits of his research, his story of Joseph and Mary with the baby Jesus in the temple, meeting Simeon and Anna. And the previous verse, the one just before our text in Luke, comes actually only eight days after Jesus' birth. He was taken to the temple, a short walk from Bethlehem. He was taken to the temple to be circumcised on the eighth day. If you do the math, you can figure out that our New Year's Day was Jesus' circumcision day and his name-giving day in Jewish custom. Our lesson, then, is the next story, 32 days later, which might bring a certain amount of confusion. We do read the Bible a little out of chronological order in order to adjust to the Sundays and seasons of the church year. Let me invite you to see some of the church year in the front of your hymnals. If you get them out, please. If you love Roman numerals here in great shape, if you hated them, please bear with us anyway. At the very front, Roman numeral XXII is the page to be on. The top says Feasts and Festivals. If you'll move down the left-hand column, again, that's Roman numeral page XXII, Feasts and Festivals. If you'll move down the left-hand column, you will get to February 2nd. And the title for that, The Purification of Mary and the Presentation of Our Lord. And if you move all the way to the right, to the third column, there it is. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 22. There's our lesson. And by the way, if you want to move back up the column, you will see it. December 26th, that was the day of St. Stephen. That is to say, the day of St. Stephen's. That is kind of a birthday for our congregation. So that's a bit of the church calendar, but we're not at February 2nd right now. If you'll back up two full pages, XVIII, three-year lectionary series C, and if there you'll drop down to Christmas 1. That's exactly where we are. We heard the reading from Exodus, we heard the reading from Colossians, and here it is, our lesson for this first Sunday after Christmas, from Luke chapter 2. The first Sunday after Christmas, and you know we may even get to a second Sunday after Christmas. Many of the Sundays of the church year get numbers. Two for Christmas, as many as eight for Epiphany, five for Lent, and look at the collection for Easter, it goes down to seven. <laughs> so far for those Sundays, but we can go a little farther. Note the columns, Old Testament reading, Epistle, and Holy Gospel. Sometimes it's simply first reading and second reading. If you've wondered, this is where pastors usually <coughs> have the lists of readings. It goes into the bulletin and becomes part of the preaching. There are a lot of options, but this is the basic one. 
we do get some order. We start with Advent, preparing for Christ to come, Christmas in Bethlehem, Epiphany, in particular the wise men, maybe two years later, the teaching time for Jesus then. We get to Lent, his suffering and his death, and the church calendar continues with his resurrection, with his ascension after all those Easter Sundays, and then if you move to the next page, we can get after ascension, Pentecost. We do have some chronological order in this church here. You might notice the priorities. We do get 12 days for Christmas. But we only get one real Christmas day with maybe four services. Around Easter, we have not only a service for every day of Holy Week leading up to Easter, but seven weeks of Easter and lots of services. Our Christian faith center is not just around a cute little baby, but around a victorious Lord. So much at the moment for looking at the church here. If you want some more information, I'd be happy to talk with you at some other time. More seriously, I suggest that there's a little bit of confusion here, because today we're looking at 40 days out, and then we come actually on New Year's Day to eight days out from Jesus' birth. But there might be other confusion. Simeon and Anna are just kind of hanging around the temple. Now, we're very grateful for how many of you help out at St. Stephanus from time to time, but this is not your usual place to chill or hang out. Comparison to a European cathedral might be helpful. There's a big square out in front, lots of places to sit. There are occasional vendors going by with food and several services a day. That might give you a better sense of what it meant to be hanging around the temple area in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. Another confusion, what is this that the spirit is on Simeon? Well, in the first place, the Holy Spirit of God has come on all believers. Please enjoy that. If in the midst of your struggles and celebrations of your life, you are trusting that God in Christ is a gift to you for forgiveness, that is the essential mark that the Spirit is with you. You may not have all the answers, but you know you have God's love in Christ. The Spirit has been working in you. Christian ideas, concepts, doctrines, those are wonderful. But the first mark of the Spirit is that you trust God's forgiveness in Christ. This reference for Simeon is something like a reference for Old Testament prophets. The Spirit can give particular guidance at particular times. Guidance is always connected in the Spirit's work with attention to God in Christ. Sometimes there may be something extra with that guidance. You may have heard this if you were in our last Advent service here with Jack and Kathy Carlos, who were serving as missionaries in Guinea in West Africa. A woman in their village, not a Christian, was given a dream, and that dream was part of her coming to faith in Jesus Christ. The Spirit may do some unusual things from time to time, centered in Christ. But then, did you catch some of those opening lines? That Joseph and Mary are going to Jerusalem for purification rites required by the law of Moses. Luke is not talking about the all-demanding law of God that confronts us with our sin. Luke is talking about the Old Testament laws, the ceremonial and cultural laws. What, I thought, the great Jesus was free of all these things. Free he is, as he will demonstrate in his ministry. If the disciples are hungry, or a man needs healing, Jesus can set aside the cultural and ceremonial laws, as we can do here, for example, in the days when we have guitar and drums instead of organ. Note especially that here on his 40th day, Jesus makes clear that his coming to be among us, to live human, is to live human life with us, not to float above us somehow in a lovely never-never land of always happy. That's also true of Jesus' circumcision on the eighth day. Eight days old for a ceremonial purpose, but a ceremonial purpose with huge teaching and love behind it. Already at eight days, Jesus will shed his blood to be with us. Before even as a human infant, he could have thought about it. He is sacrificing himself for us. One more confusion. 
Joseph and Mary fulfilled the law with two turtle doves. We've been singing about Jesus as the king in all his glory. He was born into poverty. That's what the note is about, that they were going to bring two, dud, two pigeons or two turtle doves. Jesus was born into poverty. Excuse me, Pastor Carter, confusion? What? Christians with confusion? We are forgiven saints, not perfect saints. In the midst, then, of whatever your confusion and wondering may be, and in the midst of our sin, let Simeon be our guide. He does discuss pain for Jesus. Jesus will be spoken against. There will be falling and rising because of Jesus. And Simeon goes ahead to say, and for you to Mary, and by implication, us, there will be suffering. But Simeon gives the focus to Jesus. Simeon has seen and held God's salvation, pain, piercing pain in our lives. But that's a part of God entering in. There is no other world than this painful and struggling one. We may have hope and wishes for the peace of heaven and pious hopes for our Christmas celebrations here. But this world is a struggling one, and even in our own congregation we have suffered. We are not many days from the suffering in Connecticut. We have had two funerals of our own. And how much sin is against us, how much sin is among us, even against one another in our congregation. Says Simeon, here, here I see God's salvation in this one. Christ entering is the gift. Our ties and socks and iPads, they are all simply the tokens and reminders of God's gift in Christ. Hear it this way from Pastor Kai Mung. He was a Danish Lutheran pastor executed by the Nazis. And he has a writing that concerns the day of St. Stephen and of Christmas. The Christ child is the world's savior and prince of peace because he is the world's greatest war lord. Apparently, there is the most glaring contrast between the Christmas gospel and the gospel for St. Stephen's day, between the Christ child and the first Christian martyr. But in reality, there is the closest connection. The pagan Christmas with eating and drinking and parties and family joy may well be contained within the Christian celebration, but it can never take the place of it. Jesus himself took an interest in family life and he attended parties, but he was nevertheless ever on his way to the cross. Let us sing our Christmas songs and eat goose, Danish tradition, eat goose and play with our children about the glittering Christmas tree. But we must never forget that the coming of Christ to earth means dauntless struggle against evil. And if we kneel by the manger in other than sentimental moods, we shall become aware that the one hand of the little child is open and kindly, and the other is clenched in blood. For us, there are so many doubts and questions that may spoil our Christmas joy. Well, but who promised you joy? It may be better that you have a poor Christmas. Don't be like a spoiled child and think of God as a great Santa Claus who has in his bag some sort of electromagnet with which to give your brain cells a shot that everything becomes gloriously clear to you and that you can be happy in harmony with yourself and the world. My friend, perhaps your doctor can do that with a stimulant that will send the blood to your brain and clarify your mind so that you see things in bright perspective. This has nothing to do with real joy. True Christmas joy, no matter how much or how little of it you may comprehend, means that you have Christ and that you go where he wants you to go. So far from Pastor Kai Hong. I invite you to take his advice. More, I invite you to take Simeon's guidance for your own life. Look for God's grace in the midst of your struggles. Water, 
Every glass of water is a gift. The water of baptism, how much more so? God giving you new life with his own name. Bread and wine, every meal that you celebrate in these days, see it coming from the hand of God. And how much more the bread and wine that we will share here, God's own embrace. He holds us, not just us holding a little child. An absolving, forgiving word here in worship or individually with the pastors in their offices. In any sharing of God's word, yes, come on Sundays and festivals of the church here to hear our pastors bring us God's gospel word. Yes, every day, any day, in a book or online, come to God's word, listening for his strong, confronting, saving love. On this first Christmas Sunday, depart in peace from this temple. Your ears have heard, your eyes have seen, and for many of you, your tongue will taste God's love for you. In Jesus' name.